Okay, so today we're just going to do a very, very quick look at uh, who we are and uh, what we do um, for those of you who are not so familiar with Spectrum Centre. Okay, Spectrum Centre is unification of former ATDI's offices in uh, the UK, the US and Brazil. Spectrum Centre are Spectrum Management Specialists and we have a flagship product called Spectrum E. Spectrum E is an off-the-shelf cost SAS solution which incorporates three modules. Spectrum Engineering, e-licensing and remote measurement modules. All three modules can be consumed in one platform. Spectrum E can be modified to spe meet specific end user needs and the platform is flexible in which it allows modifications to be made relatively easily ensuring that the outputs um, meet our end user requirements. In addition, Spectrum Centre has a long history of providing consultancy services across the board, um, across a broad spectrum of technologies. Okay, turning to our offices. So we have three main centres for our offices, one in the US, one in the UK and one in Brazil. Our US offices include um, Spectrum Centre Inc, where we see the hub of our development of products uh, and international distribution. LLC, which is a sister company to Inc, which is, uh, has a focus on federal agencies. And also Spectrum Centre Limited, which is the London-based um, sales office for regions of ITU, regions one to three, one and three. And lastly, our offices in Brasilia, um, in Brazil. Uh, the focus there is to support Anatel, the national regulator in Brazil, um, but also to support other countries that have our, our products as well. Anatel has uh, our delivery, which is um, of Spectrum E. It's a modified spectrum management solution, um, which is called Mosaico. Okay, so just a very quick look at some of those references that we have here. Um, we have a host of federal customers. Um, the federal customers are predominantly um, in the US. And for those of you who are not aware, they are. Um, uh, each federal agency has a, a spectrum management group or team. In addition, we have a wide range of national spectrum managers um, across uh, North America, South America, and growing within, like I say, the other regions one and three for the ITU areas. Um, alongside, uh, this is a list of our regulators, the agencies that we've got, and as you can see, there's, there's quite a quite a broad spectrum in terms of size and, and the type of different the type of service that we've provided them is all based on our Spectrum E platform. We recently awarded um, a contract with MOC Israel, the, the national regulator there, and we've got other awards that are in progress in Region 1 and we're growing in Region 3. We'll keep you updated of all of that progress as, as those, uh, those, those contracts come in. Okay, so the deliveries that we ordered well, that we have for those are mostly off the shelf modified solutions where we take that Spectrum Me off the shelf solution and modify it to meet the end user needs. Sometimes the, uh, those, uh, those deliveries are rebranded. For example, Anatel in uh, Brazil have a system that they've now renamed to Mosaico and similarly Hertz for Intercom in Argentina. I'm going to hand over now to um, Daniel, Daniel Humar, who's going to give you a little bit of background into today's um, subject. Over to you, Daniel. Okay, so uh, I think we have to go to the next slide. Okay, uh, thank you, Sarah. So, um, by the way, if there's any issues with the audio, uh, don't worry. Uh, the the webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube later today. So I think some people will have some uh, some questions on audio. Um, but uh, on our side, the, the it, it, that is, should be all right, but maybe everyone's internet connection is a little different. So uh, for today, we're going to focus on modeling TDOA, AOA, hybrid geolocation in Spectrum E. This is a feature that we have been working on for a few months, um, since I think roughly November, December last year. And uh, we, we thought it was a little bit of a niche feature. We didn't think there would actually be that much resonance in the, uh, in the commercial market for it. We were working for a few specific customers to help them with this capability. But it actually has gotten quite a bit of attention. 
And so um, what we're going to discuss today is how we go about uh, setting up a TDOA AOA geolocation simulation. Now, this capability was not designed to measure the performance of a, of a, of a vendor's uh, equipment. Um, it's really uh, designed more to serve as like a simulating baseline. We don't pretend to have all the inputs of every um, vendor's uh, equipment or every manufacturer's equipment that would increase the, the precision or accuracy of their devices. Um, this is, again, just to kind of, if lack of a better phrase, we could say service kind of almost like a worst case scenario type of what it would be minimally expected in the deployment of a, uh, of a sensor or network in charge of performing geolocation uh, tasks. So um, it just a reminder, TDOA stands for time difference of arrival, AOA angle of arrival. Um, so that is kind of was the, the purpose of uh, our implementation. Um, so it is to help, uh, you know, the features are, are there to help design uh, kind of a, a monitoring uh, sensor network. Um, could be for, let's say, a national network. Uh, either or, or, or kind of a pre-deployment strategy uh, for a military organization. Um, so the, uh, the effort was guided by IT recommendations, in particular the SM2356 and the SM2211. Those are specifically procedures for planning and optimization of spectrum audio networks in the VHF UHF frequency range. <laughs> and the comparison of time difference of arrival and angle of arrival methods of signal geolocation. So um, they, they did serve as decent guidance. They didn't, these recommendations aren't specifications. I think that's important to note. There's a lot of in between that needs to be clarified. Um, and so that, that, that we were able to achieve um, this kind of clarification in our implementation by talking with other vendors in the space and uh, working with their um, uh, their experience, their knowledge, their know-how, as, uh, as can be imagined, a lot of vendors have their own tools for doing this sort of simulation, but they don't necessarily distribute it commercially. Um, as far as I know, Spectrumy is the first uh, tool to offer this kind of functionality in a commercial off-the-shelf software product. So um, I, I, we did do some research into other available tools. There really wasn't much in the marketplace that we could find that did this work. Um, as you'll see, it is very computationally intensive, especially uh, when you're creating the uh, hybrid geolocation uh, maps, the heat maps. Um, they're, they're extremely computationally intensive and uh, Spectrum was designed though to handle large amounts of computation, especially the cloud version that's leveraging our processing capability on our cloud servers. Um, we're able to achieve uh, this kind of uh, simulation in a very uh, reasonable amount of time. So it doesn't require hours or days to complete the simulation. As you'll see during the demonstration, it's a matter of minutes. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So um, the audience for this capability from what we um, projected would primarily be regulatory and military type customers, um, perhaps obviously commercial customers as well, but we weren't able to identify specifically who that would be. And, um, you know, but anyone that is interested in this, of course, is a commercial capability with our product line. So anyone can purchase the the tool and test this capability out. So um, we kind of listed a few of the kind of criteria that would be relevant to these uh, to this kind of an audience. So one would be pre-deployment analysis. So having some planning capability for the deployment of a monitoring sensor network, we felt that that was probably very important for regulators that want to expand their uh, spectrum monitoring capabilities, and of course, military organizations that can't afford to go into an environment a priori and perform measurements. They need to do a lot of their um, deployment analysis um, through simulators or through other tool sets um, to identify what would be uh, the most um, efficient type of uh, network deployment in a theater of combat. <clears throat> um, 
performance baseline. Um, this is another criteria that we thought would appeal um, to both types of uh, groups of customer, potential customer bases. So regulatory or customers, as we uh, spectrum uh, authorities, uh, telecommunications authorities, um, again, to support the deployment uh, of a uh, monitoring or expansion of a monitoring network, they may need to have some sort of a baseline of expectation as to how the monitoring network should perform for time difference of arrival, geolocation, angle of arrival, geolocation, and hybrid geolocation, so that they can have some sort of a bar barometer of expectation for uh, a vendor that would propose to them um, you know, their equipment. And the vendor of then, of course, then would be able to communicate how they can meet or exceed those expectations. And the same would be for a military organization purchasing equipment from a vendor may also have a baseline of expectation that they need to um, uh, you know, communicate. And uh, then that, that would determine whether, you know, if the vendor that they're working with or talking to is um, you know, able to comply or not. And speaking of compliance, regulatory compliance, obviously for spectrum regulatory organizations, regulatory compliance is, is necessary. So having a tool to help um, kind of confirm that the monitoring network would, or at least communicate or articulate the, the compliance of the monitoring network in a report or uh, add it to a report for oversight purposes, auditing purposes, that, that could also be very beneficial to a regulatory organization and potentially military as well, but we didn't check it specifically for military, but um, we think regulators, of course, that's a big thing is to make sure that the tool sets and the capabilities that they have are able to comply with the uh, regulatory expectations. And then lastly is electronic warfare. Obviously, that'd be very specific to military type customers that want to dimension how they could, you know, uh, um, design a network that would target a potential uh, threat. And uh, obviously, from there, uh, allow them to follow up to eliminate the threat. Um, so those were the, the areas uh, that we wanted to focus on a little bit for to the, uh, the current presentation, how the functionality uh, appeals to this sort of uh, criteria. And, uh, and that's kind of, the, kind of the, the purpose of the demo. But again, if you're uh, not one of these types of customers, if you're not a regulator or a military organization, this uh, webinar could still be very interesting uh, from a regulatory, I mean, from an educational perspective um, or for you know, maybe other personal uh, interests. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, from here I can let Ross take over who can talk a little bit about the definitions of AOA, TDOA, and hybrid geolocation. Yep, thanks very much, Daniel. And uh, thanks again, Sarah, for the introductions. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about the concepts of TDOA, AOA, hybrid geolocation. So Daniel's already touched on TDOA, time difference of arrival, AOA, angle of arrival, and hybrids are a combination of the two geolocation methods, um, taking the benefits of both these methods and creating a hybrid uh, kind of sensor network to geolocate targets within the, the area of interest. Um, so, so taken from one of the ITU documents, this table here kind of defines the, the, the pros and cons effectively of each of the different technologies. So I'm going to go through them one by one and um, share a bit of an example so you can sort of picture it in your head how the these different technologies are working and the combination is the hybrid approach as well. So the first one that we'll discuss is the AOA. So I'll just move my slide on. So AOA um, it requires a minimum of two stations to, to, to operate. Uh, and what it does is it looks at the angle of arrival um, from a, an AOA sensor, which is connected to an, an antenna array. So it can identify what angle that the target emission is coming into that sensor from. So when you have uh, more than two of these AOA stations, you can start to build up and triangulate um, a location for where that target could be within your area of interest. So obviously the more stations you have, the more accurate uh, 
and the, the smaller the area that the target could be in. Um, so for this example here, you can see the purple cones um, for, from each of the area of, in, area of uh, angle of arrival sensors. Um, and they all meet in the middle uh, at this target point. So you can see the number of overlapping um, stations each of uh, the area around the target. Um, so either one, two, or in the middle where all three uh, stations combine. Um, so obviously all these AOA sensors would be connected over a data network to share the information that they're all receiving. And then from that, uh, in a real deployment, you'd be able to figure out where potentially the target could be located. For TDOA, it's the time difference of arrival. So this can be set up with a, a more simple, just an Omni antenna is generally used for these deployments. Um, you do require a, a three stations as a minimum, um, but again, the more stations that are involved in the network, the greater accuracy and um, you have a higher chance of pinpointing that target within the, the area of interest. So again, uh, these sort of parabolas, sort of hypercones they're generally called, um, are, are the combination of where the time difference of arrival of this target located within the, the area of interest um, kind of conjoin and we can see for this individual square. So when we're creating the heat maps um, of the, the target areas, these are the calculations that are going on in the background for each individual pixel or point within the, the calculation and builds up the picture so we can get a, an accuracy uh, for the whole coverage area as well. So we can combine the three methods, or the, the two methods, sorry, to create the, the hybrid approach. So here we can see we've got angle of arrival and time difference of arrival, um, sort of a hybrid um, of the two technologies. So we can see the, the cones coming out um, here from the AOA sensors. And we can see this kind of, it's a very shallow parabola um, from the TGOA aspect as well. Um, so we can see the, the different um, objects in motion in here. So that hopefully gives a bit of a background about how the technology works. Um, and what we'll do now is move on to a demonstration to show you how this works within our platform Spectrum E. So the first thing I'm, we're going to do is show you how to set up the objects, what parameters are taken in, uh, calculate the path loss matrix, uh, which allows us to be able to look at the, the uplink field strength received from a mobile, a target object within the area. The uplink overlap shows from our sensor network how many stations potentially could, are overlapping on a specific area of the map. And that again allows when we're planning and creating our baseline network to iterate over uh, using some of the, these different functions to, to maximise the, the benefits of the network that we're, um, that, that we're, that we're planning or that we're looking to model. Um, so again, we can be taken out if there's a, too many stations that are overlapping in a specific area, we might want to move those, take them out. Um, and again, the opposite with uh, a few stations overlapping. So the geolocation function is what we'll cover, and then the ways that we can output to the map as well. So get started with the demo. Uh, and we'll do that by just loading up Spectrum E. So again, Spectrum E is their platform uh, built by Spectrum Center. Today, we're going to be running the demonstration off our own servers online. Um, and again, this is accessed through the web browser. So whether it's a local installation, either on a specific laptop or PC, whether it's on a local cloud, uh, or when it, whether it's on our hosted cloud as well, there's different options um, for the platform. <clears throat> we'll log into our map. And we'll just zoom out to have a look at the extent of the stations that we've put down for our demonstration network today. So we'll 
first of all, got a couple of target TD way, uh, a number of TD way stations, then a target as well that we're looking to identify and understand how this network can identify that um, the location of that target uh, and with what accuracy as well. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll, we'll have a look at one of these sensors and just have a look at the parameters that we have set up. So the sensors are within the objects here. So we can see we've got our four sensors. Uh, we've got the information about the antenna heights, the location, and uh, the frequency that we're designing this network for, or modeling it, and then the specific technology that we're using. So for the initial stages, we're going to be looking at the TDOA technology. Then we'll add the AOA sensors uh, to make a hybrid uh, network. And we'll look at the differences between those two um, as we go up. So the first thing that we'll do for our network is we'll calculate the path loss matrix. So this calculates the, the path losses from the sensor out a specific radius around that sensor and calculates for each pixel um, the path losses along that path. So we'll load this up. Um, here we're going to look at the 1812 model, um, but later on I'll show that the other models are available and when they might be used. So we've got our receive antenna height and our calculation distance. Uh, I'll change our profile sampling here and we'll run this pass loss matrix. So we can see one one quick clarification. So in this case, we're actually doing a path loss matrix, like Ross said, but uh, the receive height is actually uh, it's it's acting as a transmit height. So in the inside of Spectrum E, when we create the path loss matrix, we can then afterwards interpret it how we want, and that's what Ross is going to get to in a moment. So when you saw the receive height, that in this particular simulation, that's kind of relevant it's going to pretend to be like we're acting we're treating it like the transmit height of course so um then ross is going to go over how we interpret that as a kind of reverse coverage in the tool yeah th thanks for that daniel uh, so now we've um calculated the path loss matrix and we can see as we were calculating there we had all four sensors being calculated in parallel so what that means is rather than sequentially going through each sensor we're able to calculate them all um, and depending on the number of cores, the process and power of the machine that we're operating on, um, that would take a fraction of the time to, to go through each of those in sequence. So as Daniel alluded to, <clears throat> what we're going to look to do initially is look at the uplink um, from a mobile within the area of interest uh, to the sensors. So we're going to effectively do a reverse coverage so what this looks to take in as a parameter is the, the mobile ERP. Um, and as Daniel said, the, the path loss matrix is interpreted. So rather than going from the sensor to the, the various points around the within the area of interest, we're looking at from each point, effectively we've got a mobile operating at a specific power output. And we're going to look at how that um, is managed there. So we'll, we'll name the prediction and we'll calculate this uplink coverage map um, for the composite of all four stations. So we can click that and quite quickly we can see this output map. So what we'll do now is we'll just change to a workable threshold. Again, depending on the technology, the parameters that you'll be using um, will vary and depending on the equipment manufacturer settings as well. Um, if you're trying to model specific um, specific equipment, but generally, as a baseline, this would be the sort of minimum coverage that you would expect um, from a system. So we can see here we've got our uh, uplink coverage um, from for each individual point um, for the composite of all the stations here. We go to the network, we'll select all stations again, and this time we'll look at the uplink overlap. So this identifies the number of stations 
they have a threshold, um, an uplink received threshold of 20 dB microvolts per meter or more. We'll keep the, the ERP of the mobile and um, our target device the same. And then we'll just rename this our TDOA example here. We'll process this. We'll be able to see the output and how that's calculated. So here we can see the green areas. All four stations um, have a, an uplink received threshold of 20 dB microvolts per meter or above. The yellow, we have two stations that can cover those areas. Um, blue and green, uh, blue and red, so yellow and red, um, looking at two and only an individual station has the, the, the threshold met at the red areas around the, the kind of perimeter of the main target. So what that means and why we might want to do that is when we're placing these TTOA sensors, if we're getting too much overlap, we can start to move sensors about. Um, and again, for the coverage, for the receive level, um, depending on the, the minimum or the, the input requirements into our um, we would, sorry, um, depending on the input requirements of the system we're modelling, um, we would just have to uh, change the, the sensors uh, around to, to clarify that. Uh, to yeah, so trust. just to, yeah, so the, the, the uplink overlap feature, it allows us to kind of the user to do a little bit of dimensioning and planning and so in this particular setup there's a a good amount of overlap here in the in the center of this uh particular city area and uh you know we should have probably a decent chance of getting a geolocation to the target depending on the the precision of the tdoa um, capabilities of the equipment um but uh, we have a good deal of overlap Obviously, uh, we would imagine that the geolocation would be within the blue and green areas because that's the criteria for the TDOA. Um, and so, uh, obviously, when we add in other geolocation techniques, we would be able to maybe get a little bit more. Um, of course, this depends on the threshold and accuracy and capability of the equipment and the precision of the equipment. But um, this just gives kind of a rough idea of what the expectation would be. So we we do imagine that uh, we would with TDOA we probably would not get cover uh, geolocation in the red or yellow areas. Yeah, that that's, that's so. With that with that map, once we've got to a stage um, for the the modeling, the next part that we'll look at is the the geolocation function itself. So once we've created the path loss matrices. Um, that's a minimum requirement for being able to, to utilise the geolocation function, as with the, the uplink field strength receive and the uplink overlap function as well. So we'll click the geolocation. We'd have a look at the, the input parameters for that. So here we've got our area of interest. So that's just a box area um, to, to limit the extent of the area that we're going to be, be running the calculations in. As Daniel referred to earlier, the calculations are pretty intensive. Um, there's a high number of calculations per point, and um, there's overlaps and filtering and um, a whole lot of other stuff that goes on in the background. So, um, under limiting that extent, we'll uh, kind of optimize the the time it takes for the the calculations to run. And um, here, because we're looking at a, a kind of coverage um, at, uh, coverage accuracy map, we're going to leave it at all points. But if we add in a target, we can identify that specific target and we'll be able to see the hyper cones or the, the cones from the angle of arrival as well as we show as we saw in the slides earlier on so we'll leave these parameters um, as they are we can also set an accuracy limit so if the the accuracy of the output is greater than a specific threshold it will just cut off and we can also filter by that um, above that limit as well. So if we're not interested, if the accuracy is over a kilometre, over 800 metres in this instance, we can just cut off those values. Um, there we go. So we've, again, we've selected all the objects um, as we came into this function, but if we're, we're not sure, we can always 
select all objects again. So this will take a couple of seconds to run. And we'll be presented here with the output map. So the output map is a type meters palette. So that's um, shown by the postfix after the, the name of this study or the name of the prediction. And here we've set various thresholds um, going roughly 25 meter steps, going from our lowest to our highest. So we can see here, um, this area in the middle, there's a good chance that we can uh, identify the targets with quite a high accuracy. And then as we go further out, um, areas where there's maybe only three sensors rather than the full four, um, we, we increase the accurate or, or decrease the accuracy effectively that we're able to identify that target with. So we can use the crosshair and move around the screen. And we're able to read off the, the accuracy for that specific point. So this purple area here, we can see where it's 60 meters, which corresponds to the purple color. And then as we go to the red area, um, what this will be is that this will be anywhere over 400 meters, but then at a maximum of 800 meters, which is where we set our limit to. So potentially areas that are not shaded um, could have an accuracy greater than 800 meters, um, but that's where we would set our limits to the area of interest and the thresholds and accuracies that we're interested in when we're running the calculations. So we'll go back to our network and what we'll do is we'll run a similar situation with a hybrid. And just before we do that, what we'll do is we'll just take a screenshot just so we can compare the two. Um, so that this is the TDOA and we'll also compare this with the, the hybrid as well. So what we'll do is we'll just modify these objects, change the technology, so instead of just TDOA, we'll make it TDOA and AOA um, in a hybrid. Select them all. And we'll run this path loss matrix again. Select all. Run the geolocation function for the area of interest and all points. And if we calculate this, we should see the, the composite accuracy map for the, the hybrid stations now. So here we go. So we can see that we're getting better results compared to our, um, let's shift this over. Um, almost, yeah, better results compared to our uh, accuracy map for the TDOA only. So we can see these areas over to the west have been covered in. Um, it's a bit more, um, a, a kind of fuller map as well. So we can see there. So what I've covered so far um, is how we can set up the sensor network. Uh, how we run the path loss matrix, the, the uplink field strength received, the uplink overlap, and then the geolocation functions. So what I'll show now is this has just been for a small test network. What I'll do is show this on a, a larger scale network and then show you some of the ways we can output the functions and filter for the reports and the outputs that we're going to produce as well. So what I'll do is I'll just change yeah, turn this prediction off first, just by unselecting it. Go back to our map. <clears throat> what we'll do is we'll just change our network to this larger network here. So in this example, um, this, this larger network we have, we have um, 73 sensors this time rather than just four. They're a mixture of AOA, TDOA, hybrid, um, all with, again, various antenna heights, probably more like you'd get in a, a real deployment, a real model um, potential. So for this, 
I've already created the, the outputs for the map. Um, obviously, because we've got a larger network, it takes a bit longer, but I can share how long it took to run some of the calculations and um, show, show the outputs as well for you. So if we go to our map page, we'll just zoom out and we can see the extent of the network first. So we can see all the, the stations here are located um, in an area roughly about, I think that's about 250 kilometres by about 100 kilometres in depth. So we can see we've got a quite a large network. Um, and again, if you're rolling out or trying to model national networks, this is the sort of scale that you'll be operating at, and um, possibly even larger. So we can turn on our predictions, um, the predictions that we saved earlier. So the first one that we're going to look at is the field strength received, uh, the composite coverage map. And we can see that there. So to create this coverage map, the path loss matrix that we ran um, for around 100 meter kind of, um, horizontal accuracy um, pixels uh, took around two and a half minutes. Um, obviously, as you go up the accuracy, if you're looking to run this at maybe 50 metres or 25 metres, again, you'd have an increase. But certainly, the first couple of stages, you probably run quite a low accuracy um, to, to be able to iterate over faster. And then as you get to your final deliverables, you increase the accuracy and let the, let the example run. Uh, our next map that we're, we're going to have a look at Again, going back to the predictions, is our uplink overlap. So as we created with our four stations earlier, here we can see, and now we've got um, six or more overlapping stations in the blue area. Um, so again, how you want to manage the network and the technologies you're using will all depend on the minimum number of stations that you require to have an overlap. Um, sometimes it can be extra resiliency um, within the network as well, having multiple stations, um, and you'd maybe gain accuracy in terms of what's, uh, what look uh, yeah, the accuracy of targets you can identify with more stations as well. So our final um, map that we're going to show is the, the dual location. So if we again go to predictions, we'll click our geolocation map. So here we can see the, the geolocation results um, for the specific parameters that we've, we've input. So I think we've, we've kept it quite similar to what we did in the, the initial tests um, and just scaled it up here. So we can see um, from here, we've got some quite good areas um, where the accuracy is um, kind of in our purple to blue range, and then some sort of red areas here as well, and um, where the accuracy is a bit poorer. So again, depending on your area of interest, what areas you're trying to cover, whether it's city centres or more remote areas, um, you'll be able to start modifying this network to to get close to uh, the the outputs that you're that you're interested in as well. So that's just a a brief overview um, for this map here, the geolocation one, this one took about eight minutes to run. So after we've run the path loss matrix, we would run the, the geolocation function and that took um, yeah, just over eight minutes to run for this, this example here. So again, that's a good way to iterate over. It's not taking a, an overly long time. You could maybe make a cup of tea or something, come back and your, your calculations are done and you're ready to have a look at it, make any changes and then iterate over that example as well. So what I've been able to show is how we can set up the sensor and network, use the path loss matrix to calculate um, the sensor's kind of effectively coverage range, um, show a couple of outputs that we could create from that path loss matrix and the geolocation function as well. So finally, what we'll have a look at is the, the export to Google Earth function. Um, and the coastline filtering as well. So with the coastline filtering, what that allows us to do is a function that with an output that we've created, uh, a prediction that we've saved and named, 
we can filter it to either exclude water areas, so areas over sea or, or um, lakes, etc., or isolate the water. So this would crop effectively around the, the sea areas, our prediction. Um, so for maybe coast guards and if you're interested in direction or geolocation within water, um, over water areas, you can isolate the two um, the two areas effectively um, to to get the kind of land use or uh, for better words that you're interested in either over water um, or not. Um, so we would just select the prediction that we're interested in, run that filter, and then it would exclude or include only the, the areas that we're interested in. And finally, the export to Google Earth uh, allows us to export any coverage prediction that we've run to Google Earth. Um, so we'll look at one of these examples here. So we can have a look at our TDOA coverage. Um, this can also be done for the accuracy maps as well. Um, and again, the process takes a couple of seconds. We've downloaded it to our local PC. And we can open it within Google Earth or any software that would take a KMZ file. Um, so either load to our GIS for record keeping, share it with someone. Um, there's a variety of other things that we can do with it at that stage. So that will take it into, I think this one that was one of the earlier coverages we did. So we can see the, the coverage here within Google Earth. We can sort of zoom in, look for areas of interest, and we could also add the specific stations to that map as well um, if we highlight them as we come into this function. So that's a, an overview of the, the geolocation functions, uh, a bit of theory for the background of how, to, how they're set up, um, uh, the demonstration within Spectrum E. So I'll pause there and uh, pass to Sarah to see if we've had any questions come in. Uh, through the presentation. But thanks very much for uh, your attention. That's lovely. Thank you, Ross. Thanks, for, thanks, Daniel, for presenting today. We've had got a few questions that are coming in. Please do use that uh, questions toolbar. Um, we'll put your questions to the presenters um, in, in a minute. Um, just a couple of things we'll follow up from today. There is a white paper that's associated with today's events. That's a, a white paper help guide that we've provided. Anyone that completes a survey will have access to that, so please do complete that survey link that I'll send lately, later. As I explained, we will have today's event recorded, so... I can go over the questions one by one that we've got. Perfect. Um, yes. Uh, uh, well, for the uh, for the generation of the geolocation heat map, uh, Pathos Matrix is a prerequisite. You, know, you have to create some sort of a propagation um, analysis in order to uh, to generate uh, the geolocation heat map. You have to have an idea of the amount of loss, propagation loss between the target transmitter and the sensor, which is the receiver. So the uh, the next question I see here is. Uh, can the tool estimate the best combination of sensor sites uh, out of a list of candidate sites, TDOA or AOA? Um, that's a good question. Uh, that's kind of what the tool is, this or this particular feature is designed to do, is to, as you saw in the example, Ross, uh, would swap between AOA or TDOA or hybrid uh, to see what's the, the benefit that we get. Uh, it, it, the tool doesn't have any kind of like automated feature that will tell you right away TDOA or AOA is better. But that's something that, you know, in time maybe we could implement. We'd have to, you know, work with a, a specific customer and identify use cases on how that would actually work in an automated manner. But, um, but yeah, the tool is designed to highlight the difference or the benefits between uh, the, either one of the geolocation techniques that we've uh, discussed today. Next question, how the tool makes a decision uh, which site should be AOA, TDOA. So that's, it, it, the tool's not making a decision for anyone. The tool is it's just a simulator. Uh, so it's just telling you where the, where you could get benefit if you have your sensor at a particular location. So we, we created a kind of a neutral example. We, we didn't want to use obviously any proprietary information. We're not allowed to disclose anything like that. So we just kind of created a very simplistic example of how the tool will highlight the benefits of going TDOA versus hybrid, uh, you know, kind of uh, 
show you what, what the advantages are if you bring in AOA geolocation and, and, and into your TDOA geolocation um, uh, approach. So um, that's what the tool will highlight for you. Um, it's, a, it's a simulator. Um, next question is, uh, let's see. Um, Sorry, let me scroll down here. Uh, does the tool operate independently or can it be integrated with the monitoring system? So we're not, uh, one thing uh, that we meant to highlight, I hope we, we made it a little clear earlier, the software does not um, uh, promote any particular vendor's equipment. This is a completely neutral uh, development tool. So it's not uh, partial to a particular manufacturer or anything like that. Well, Spectrum Center is not in the business of selling spectrum monitoring equipment or uh, uh, signal strength analyzers or anything like that. We, we don't get into that at all. So um, this is really more for customers that would maybe want to have a kind of a, a neutral view on the baseline performance of a spectrum monitoring network for geolocation. Um, and then, you know, then they could choose to compare that with the kind of uh, outputs or uh, reports that they would be given from a, from a different series of vendors. So in, let's say in a tendering process or in some other types of kind of uh, effort where they need to kind of evaluate the performance of vendors, a tool like this could help serve as like a baseline expectation on the performance of a monitoring network. Um, and we do integrate with all, pretty much all the most well-known spectrum monitoring vendors out in the market today. So we, that's a whole other part of our software we call the remote measurement, remote monitoring module, where we can take measurement data from, uh, um, uh, including like geolocation results or other types of measurement results from uh, um, measurement equipment and pull that into our system can use it for various purposes to compare with, you know, authorized emissions in the spectrum management database or to compare with other types of uh, simulations to help calibrate the simulator, things like that. So there's uh, there's that whole other part of the tool that at some point we may do a little bit of a, maybe see if we could do a product demonstration of the remote monitoring or measurement uh, uh, module, uh, but uh, that's not for today. Um, Another question, can you change the target modulation to compare the effectiveness of the various uh, networks against the different emission types? Very good question. Um, so that would be a function of the propagation analysis. So uh, in, the, in the propagation analysis, we didn't spend a lot of time on that, but you have the ability to produce different types of propagation uh, studies. You could produce a dB microvolt per meter study, a DBM study, a signal to noise ratio study, a power flux density study. And so um, the modulations or the, the, the equipment performance uh, or the service uh, perform expectations or the throughput requirement, this usually has a relationship to one of those types of outputs. It has a relationship to an SNR or, or C over I criteria or a uh, signal strength criteria. So there is a feature in the tool to determine, you know, what that, let's say you have a 64 quam type modulation with X amount of throughput. There is a little calculator in the tool, this Shannon Hartley calculator that will help uh, determine, okay, what would be the corresponding, you know, um, threshold that would, in terms of, uh, like I said, the C to Y criteria or C over N criteria or uh, signal strength criteria, receive signal strength criteria, um, that would you know be equivalent, that, that, that would uh, allow you to meet that 64 qualm uh, modulation. So then you would just enter in that threshold in the coverage calculation and in the geolocation calculation, and then you would be able to identify if your geolocation uh, setup, your, your, your sensor network would be able to target that specific, uh, modulation effectively. Um, next question, the geolocation accuracy and map and the overlapping map had big different differences in the coverage area with three TDOA stations. The accuracy results were more than two kilometers, yeah, uh, with the same threshold. That's true. 
the overlapping map is not meant to be an identical map to the uh, geolocation map. So as you saw, the overlap map is just there to highlight where there's overlap. And so you have an idea, okay, anything that's three overlap of three stations or more, I should have TDOA geolocation or two stations or more, I would have hybrid or AOA geolocation. So that just kind of gives you, you know, a baseline idea like what's to be expected. So the geolocation map then will be different um, because it's trying to show you the actual accuracy in terms of distance. So you have that like distant, it's kind of like a missed distance, if you can, uh, for lack of a better phrasing, a missed distance map, how far away you are from potentially geolocating your target. So obviously where you have uh, less overlaps, your geolocation precision will be weaker. It'll, it'll be lower. So you may have, you saw the legend would go all the way down to like a, a, a kilometer or more is because you're, you're over what, uh, you know, maybe you're only getting uh, three geolocations or, 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 I mean, three overlaps or two overlaps. Um, and, uh, you know, you're going to be less precise. So um, maybe if you have a hybrid setup, uh, you can't get um, three overlaps. In the uh, in the uplink coverage or reverse coverage, uh, but you get two, so then that means you know the AOA the geolocation is allowing you to potentially target uh, the uh, the emission of interest, but it's AOA only, no longer TDOA, so it's going to be obviously not terribly precise in comparison. Um, so I think that's all the questions. I don't think we have any more. So that was a good number of questions.